Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 4th of December 2022. These are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Now let's start our discussion. Look at this. This snippet article says that new minerals have been found in the meteorite that landed in Somalia. Do you know what is the difference between meteorite and a meteor? Let's find the answer to this question in this discussion. And let us also see some of the facts about the meteorite in Somalia. Where shall I start? Let me tell you about asteroid first. An asteroid is a small rocky object that orbits the sun. They are smaller than a planet. Most asteroids in our solar system are found in the main asteroid belt. Asteroid belt is a region between Mars and Jupiter, which is full of asteroids. Since many asteroids are together, they may smash into one another. This leads to asteroid breaking off into smaller pieces. These pieces are what are called as meteoroids. So, meteoroids are small breakaway pieces from asteroids. And they can also come from comets also. Here, comet is something different from asteroid even though it also orbits the sun. Comets here are made up of ice and dust. Okay? Now, there are many situations where one meteoroid can break away and it can get close to the earth. And in some cases, it can also enter earth's atmosphere. But after entering the atmosphere, some meteoroid will vaporize. That is, they will burn up. So, it is no longer a meteoroid. Here, it turns into meteor. This vaporizing process looks like a streak of light in the sky. So, due to this feature only, we call them shooting stars. But from the above discussion, it is very clear that meteors are not actually stars, but they are breakaway pieces from asteroids. Since the meteoroids vaporize, they do not land on the earth. Okay? Then what happens to the meteoroid that does not vaporize completely in the atmosphere? What if they survive their trip through the Earth's atmosphere and land on the Earth's surface? When they land on the Earth, they are called as meteorites. Okay? One such meteorite that survived the journey is what landed in Somalia. This meteorite was found in 2020. It has two names. The locals call it Nightfall. But the scientists call it Yelali meteorite because it was found near the town of Yelali, which is in the Hiran region of Somalia. This meteorite is the ninth largest meteorite ever recorded. It is over 2 meters wide. It weighs 15 tons. It was found that it is a iron based meteorite because it is about 90% iron and nickel. After analyzing a sample of this meteorite, now scientists have found two minerals in it. One is named as El Alilite since the meteorite is found in the town of El Ali. The second one is named Elkin Stantonite. It is named after a principal investigator of NASA, Miss Lindy Elkin Stanton. It is expected that further research might reveal presence of new minerals in the meteorite. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the difference between meteoroids, meteors and meteorites. We also saw about the new minerals that are discovered in the meteorite that was found in Somalia. With this, let us conclude this discussion and move on to the next news article. Look at this article. This article talks about the plate of tampura makers in present day India. As the modern musical instruments are slowly replacing traditional instruments like tampura, surbahara, rudra veena and vichitra veena, the makers of these instruments are finding it difficult to make their ends meet. The tampura instrument which the article reports about is used in both Hindustani and Carnatic music. So, in this discussion, you will see some of the basic difference between the Carnatic and Hindustani music. We are going to discuss only the basic difference present between the two music system and we are not going to get into the technical details of them. With this disclaimer, let us start our discussion. First, let's look at the geographic area of both Hindustani and Carnatic music. Hindustani music is a classical music of the northern region of Indian subcontinent, while Carnatic music, as the name suggests, belongs to the southern part of India. Here note that Carnatic music is also performed in some parts of Sri Lanka also. The second major difference between both the art forms are with respect to the elements present in it. Hindustani music arose in the Ganga Jamunai Tazib which is nothing but a period of great influence of 
Persio Arabic arts in the Indian subcontinent, mainly the northern parts of Indian subcontinent. This music combines the Indian classical music tradition with the Persio Arabic musical language, resulting in a unique tradition of Grahana system of musical education. So, Hindustani music has the elements of both Indian, Persian, and Arabic influence. Now, coming to Carnatic music. Carnatic music is simply of Indian origin without much of the external influence. Now let us look at some of the famous musicians of these two schools. Mian Tenzin was a flag bearer of Hindustani music. It was at his time only Hindustani music in India reached its zenith. He was famous for his Draupad style of singing. Tansen sang Draupad in Mughal Emperor Akbar's court making this style of singing reach the far corners of the Indian subcontinent. The famous personality of Hindustani music presently is Sahir Hussain. On the other hand, the Carnatic music evolved due to the efforts of personalities like Shama Sastri, Tyagarajar, Muttasami Dikshitar and Saint Purandaratas. The famous MS Subbulakshmi was also a Carnatic singer. These are some of the most important figures with respect to Carnatic music. Since we are talking about singers here, we should also see about Amir Kusro who is one of the most important singers of the Indian subcontinent. Amir Kusro was an Indo-Persian Sufi singer, musician, poet and scholar who lived under the Delhi Sultanate. He is an iconic figure in the cultural history of the Indian subcontinent. He is known today for his famous Kavalis. Here, Kavalis refers to a form of Sufi Islamic devotional singing. He sang in Hindavi, a local dialect which got developed into Hindi and Urdu separately. Due to his astonishing singing skills, he is called as the Parrot of India. These are some of the important facts with respect to Amir Kusro. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. In this discussion, we saw some of the basic difference between the Hindustani and Carnatic music. Also, we saw some of the prominent singers belonging to both the musical system. Finally, we saw some points about Amir Kusro. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article here. It talks about the decision by Manipuri language newspapers to use Manipuri Mayak script instead of Bengal script in their newspaper. The decision taken is going to be implemented from January 15, 2023. According to the article, all Manipur Working Journalist Union and the Editors Guild has taken this decision after coming to an understanding with the script activists of the Milal. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the indigenous community of Manipur who are nothing but the Métis people. The Métis people or the Manipuri people are an ethnic group native to the state of Manipur in northeastern India. They primarily live in the Impal Valley region in modern-day Manipur. In addition to this, they are also present in Assam, Tirpura, Nagaland, Mehalaya and Mizoram. Here you have to note that the Meiti ethnic group represents 53% of Manipur's population. There is also a notable presence of Meiti in neighbouring countries of Myanmar and Bangladesh. This is all about the geographic distribution of Meiti people. Now, let us look at some of the cultural facets of the Meiti people. Most of the rich culture of Manipur can be credited to the Meitis. Since ancient times, people in Manipur were trading with both India and Myanmar. Due to this, cultural exchange happened. This resulted in the valley portion of Manipur become the melting pot of Indo-Burmese culture. Okay? The famous Manipuri dance, also referred to as the Manipuri Ras Leela, is one of the eight major Indian classical dance forms. The dance form is primarily based on the devotional themes. This dance is characterized by gentle eye movements and peaceful body movements. Chambals are the important musical instruments that are used while performing this dance. This is about Manipuri dance. Now coming to the martial art form of the Meitis. The Manipuri martial art, that is, Thang Ta is a combative sports which had its origin from the Meiti knights of the monarchical rule. It involves various fighting techniques with swords and spears. Now coming to the religion of the Meitis. Meitis majorly follow Vaishnavite Hinduism. Some of the Meitis traditionally believe in the local Sanamahi religion named after the god Sanamahi. This is all about the culture of the Meitis. Now coming to the economic activities of the Meitis. The primary economic activity of the Meitis is agriculture. 
shifting cultivation and terrace farming are practiced on the slopes of the hills of Manipur. Other than this, fishing is also common practice among the Metis. The famous Loktak Lake is located in Manipur only and here fishing is practiced by the Manipuri people. Here you have to note an interesting fact. Metis have a long tradition of playing polo. What is polo? Polo is the game in which a ball is chased by horsemen with long sticks. The game of polo has been integral part of the Manipuri culture through centuries of Manipuri civilization. The Britishers took a keen interest to the game played by the kings and princes of Manipur and they exported this game throughout the world which resulted in this game gaining popularity all over the world. This is about the game of polo which is traditionally practiced in Manipur. This is all about the economic activities of the Meiti people. Now let us see some of the few facts given in the news article. The article says that the arrival of Shantidas Kosai into Manipur led to the Meiti Maya getting replaced by Bengali script. Here note that Shantidas Kosai is a Vaishnavite missionary who led the conversion of Meite people into Vaishnavism. This is all about the Meite people and about the news article. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. The article talks about the success story of conservation in the Kaziranga National Park. One of the main reasons for the success in Kaziranga National Park is the Rhino Protection Force in the region. The Rhino Protection Force shoots the poachers at sight. So far, more than 55 armed men have been killed within the boundary of the reserves for unauthorized entry since 2012. So in this context, let us quickly go through Project Rhino and Project Elephant. Also, let us see some of the important points mentioned in this article. Let us begin with Project Rhino. Project Rhino is also called as Indian Rhino Vision 2020. This program was launched in the year 2005. Its main aim is to attain a wild population of at least 3000 greater Unhorn rhinos which is spread over 7 protected areas in the Indian state of Assam by the year 2020. Here, the seven protected areas include Kaziranga National Park, Pobitora National Park, Urang National Park, Manas National Park, Laukova Wildlife Sanctuary, Borachapuri Wildlife Sanctuary and Dibru Sheikova Wildlife Sanctuary. You can see the seven wildlife sanctuaries in the map given here. Remember, it is a collaborative effort between various organizations including the International Rhino Foundation, Assam's Forest Department, Bodo Territorial Council, Wildlife Fund of India and United States Fish and Wildlife Fund. The significant part of this program is the wild to wild rhino translocation. That is, moving rhinos from densely populated parks like Kaziranga National Park to ones in need of more rhinos like the Manas National Park. Now let us look at the current status of the program. See, this program is fairly successful because we have achieved the target of having 3000 wild rhino population. But in the translocation sphere, we have failed. Because in only one of the national parks, the rhino translocation occurred. That is Manas National Park. Other than this, the other planned rhino translocation failed to materialize. In addition to this, due to the coordinated effort of the forestry, local and the national government officials, the wildlife crime in Assam has been brought down significantly from 2018 to 2019. This is the current status of Project Rhino. Now let us see about Project Elephant. See, Project Elephant is a centrally sponsored scheme which was launched in the year 1992. The project is being mainly implemented in 16 states and union territories. How are these 16 states selected? See, these 16 states have wild elephants in a free-ranging population. Okay. The main objective of Project Elephant is to help the states in the protection and maintenance of these wild elephants. Secondly, the project tries to ensure the protection of elephant corridors and elephant habitat for the survival of the elephant population in the wild. Thirdly, apart from providing technical and financial help to these states, the union government also will assist them for the purpose like census, training of field officials, etc. This is done to ensure the mitigation and prevention of man-elephant conflict. Here you have to know that Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change provides the required financial and technical support to the states. This is about Project Elephant. Now let us come to the news article. See, the news article says that 
India is home to nearly 60% of Asian elephant. While the number of elephants in India has increased in the past years, the Asian elephants is still listed as a endangered species in IUCN Red List. In addition to this, in India also we have placed the elephants in the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. So, you must first know why even though wild population of elephants are increasing, we are still keeping the elephant population in the endangered list. To know the reason behind this, we must first understand the threats faced by the animal. The first and the major threat is poaching and the man-elephant conflict. See, on an average in India, nearly 500 humans and 1000 elephants are killed due to confrontation between man and elephant. This is the first major threat faced by the elephants in India. The second major threat is habitat. See, elephant habitats are fragmented in India. Due to this, there is uneven distribution of elephant population in the country. And you have to know here that elephants are migratory species. They have to move from one place to another regularly. Since the elephant habitats are fragmented and there is no corridor between the fragments, the elephants are not able to move freely. It is due to this reason only the elephants are moving into human habitat and causing havoc. So, fragmented elephant habitat and uneven distribution of elephant population is the second major threat faced by the Asian elephants in India. Moving on to the third threat, this is change in land use. Due to increasing population, what we are doing? We are changing the forest land into agricultural fields. This is reducing the habitat that is earmarked for the elephants. Due to this, elephants are finding it difficult to get food inside their habitat. So, they are moving into human territory. See, these three are the major threats faced by the Asian elephants in India. It is due to these threats only, even though the wild population of elephants in India has increased in the past couple of years, we are still placing the elephant in the endangered list and also in the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. See, to solve these threats only, Project Elephant has been launched. As we saw earlier, Project Elephant gives due attention to the elephant corridors. And these elephant corridors will link the fragmented elephant habitats. So, this will enable the free movement of the elephant from one habitat to another. Due to this free movement, the elephant will have genetic diversity. Also, it will aid in their migration pattern. This will also reduce the elephant-human conflict. In addition to this, using Project Elephant, we have established various elephant reserves in our country. This is done to ensure the long-term survival of the elephants in their natural habitat. Until now, we have established 32 elephant reserves in our country. The recent addition to the list is Agastya Malay Elephant Reserve, which was added in the year 2022. In addition to this, 101 elephant corridors have been identified in our country and the elephant corridors is also given due protection. So this is about the points mentioned in the news article. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, first we saw the reason for the success in rhino conservation in Kaziranga National Park. After that, we saw about Project Rhino, then we saw about Project Elephant, then we saw about the threats faced by Asian elephants in the country, and finally we concluded by seeing how the Project Elephant is planning to address the threats faced by elephants in our country. So with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this news article. This news article reports about a burning issue in Kerala. It is the protest against the construction of Willingham port in Kerala. As per the article, efforts are being taken by all the stakeholders to solve the issue. So let us understand the issue and also why there are protests in the area. Before getting into the discussion, I have highlighted here the syllabus regarding this discussion. You can go through it. Now let us start our discussion. The port we are discussing is the Willingham International Transshipment Deep Water Multipurpose Seaport or shortly Willingham Port. Willingham is located near Thiruvananthapuram. The port will mainly cater to container transshipment along with multipurpose cargo and break bulk cargo. Here let me explain the terminologies briefly. A container transshipment refers to the process where a cargo or a container is moved from one vessel to another. This happens while the cargo is in transit or it happens in the final destination. Then the brake bulk is meant to encompass all the cargo that is transported in bags, boxes, crates, drums or barrels. This is about 
transshipment and break bulk cargo now moving on note that the port is still under construction stage the construction started nearly 7 years ago in december 2015 after its operationalization the port will become india's first mega transshipment container terminal this is an ambitious project of the government of kerala but the project is implemented through a special purpose government company which is fully owned by the kerala government the company is called vilinjam international sea port limited that is visl are there any private parties involved in the project yes actually the port is being constructed in a landlord model with public private partnership component here the landlord model for the port or simply the landlord port is characterized by its mixed private public orientation under this model the port authority acts as a regulatory body and as a landlord on the other hand the port operation are carried out by the private companies mainly the private companies handle the cargo now in case of vilinjam port the private partner is the adani vilinjam port private limited so the adani limited will carry on the construction and it will also handle the cargo whereas the vasl will procure the land obtain environmental clearance for the project and it will also act as a regulator of the project okay now this is how this project is set to function now let us see some of the main reasons why vilinjam was chosen for the port project first reason is this region has good connectivity the region has links to national and regional road and rail network for example the national highways nh47 is in close proximity that is 10 kilometers from the vilinjam port NH47 connects Salem to Kanyakumari in Tamil Nadu via Tiruvananthapuram in Kerala and even the national rail network is less than 12 km from the proposed port site second is that this port sits in the international trade corridor as you can see in this map this region is in proximity to the international shipping lane it is just 10 nautical mile from this route the third major reason is that just 1 nautical mile from the coast of vilinjam the sea water depth is 20 meter this will help attract large container vessels so basically the port is being planned as a strategically important port located at the tip of indian peninsula but are we forgetting anything here see large projects will definitely have certain impacts on the surrounding environment to ensure the impact is minimal an assessment is carried out you all know what it is it is the environment impact assessment under the 2006 environment impact assessment notification after this only environmental clearance is given in addition to this since coastal area is involved in this project coastal regulation zone clearance is also required so did the project get any of these clearances yes actually the project has both environmental clearance and coastal zone regulation clearance from the ministry of environment okay then why are we seeing protest in news the protest are mainly done by the fishermen of the region they have several concerns regarding the project first is that they fear coastal erosion will happen because of the project this fear is not unreasonable as last year only the fishermen lost their homes to coastal erosion they believe that the port project is the main reason behind the coastal erosion they say that there are changes in the sediment deposit pattern due to which erosion has happened recently but the governments are of different opinion yes both the central and the state government they believe that there is no change in previous erosion spots of vilinjam this opinion is based on a 2019 report of the national institute of ocean technology the report is annual shoreline monitoring report according to this the beaches near vilinjam such as valliyathura Shangumugam and Puntura had remained unchanged since the construction of the port began in 2015. Here you have to note another point. Some private research studies point out that there is accelerated erosion along the coastline of Tiruvananthapuram. But among the private research also there is varying findings. Some private research shows that the port project has indeed accelerated the erosion process. But some private research show that the port project does not have any impact on the coastal erosion in vilinjam additionally the fishermen are also fearing that the port project will affect their livelihood because this port is close to the already existing fishing harbor 
so once the port is constructed the nature of the sea will be impacted and due to this the fishing from this region might be affected this is the second fear of the fishermen the fishermen fear that once the fish population near the coast is affected due to the construction of vilinjam port the fishermen have to venture deep into the sea to catch more fish and venturing deep into the sea will be a costly affair so they are asking subsidy for their fuel that is kerosene which is used in fishing boats so due to these fears only the protesters have made many demands to the government let me read out the demands first is stopping the port construction completely second is conducting a proper environmental impact study third is rehabilitation of the families who lost their homes due to coastal erosion third is taking effective steps to mitigate the coastal erosion process and last one is providing subsidy for kerosene it is said that the government agreed to almost all the demands it did not agree to the first one because government is not ready to halt the project it also did not agree to the kerosene subsidy because government fears that giving subsidy to kerosene will have environmental problems due to increased emission but the protesters are sticking to these demands and they have declared the protest will continue until all the demands are met and implemented by the government we can say that there is some confusion on what the environmental impact would be so it is only wise to conduct another environmental impact assessment maybe as a first step to this in october the kerala government constituted a four member expert committee to study the impact of the project on coastal erosion so our conclusion is that rather than just conducting this study a complete environmental impact assessment again would be the best option otherwise the protesters cannot be satisfied if the protesters do not stop it not only affects the fishermen but also the project and this will lead to wasting of tax payer money So that's all regarding this discussion. With this, let us conclude this discussion and move on to the next news article. Take a look at this article. It reports that State Department of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare in Tamil Nadu is considering relaxing the Tamil Nadu NIRA rules for the benefit of coconut farmers. If the NIRA extraction rules are relaxed, it will result in coconut farmers and producer companies getting benefited. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about what is meant by the term NIRA and what are all the health benefits associated with it. The term NIRA refers to a white colored juice obtained from the unopened coconut inflorescence. Here I have provided the image of the unopened inflorescence of coconut tree. The NIRA is extracted from the coconut tree by cutting open the unopened coconut inflorescence and tying a container to it to collect the dripping transparent liquid. After the extraction of this liquid, it is filtered to remove the impurities. Then the filtered liquid is chilled to less than 4 degrees Celsius. After this preservation process, treatment using clarifying agents are done to completely remove all the minute suspended solid particles present in the liquid. The last step in the NIRA production is pasteurization. Here, pasteurization is done to extend the shelf life of NIRA. Here you have to note that NIRA doesn't even contain even trace amounts of alcohol. It is completely a soft drink. This is the step by step procedure followed for the production of NIRA. Now let's move our attention towards the health benefits associated with consuming nira. Nira is a rich source of sugar, vitamin and minerals. Secondly, micronutrient present in nira is very high. Nira is rich in iron, phosphorus and ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is nothing but vitamin C. Thirdly, nira also has low glycemic index. Here the term glycemic index refers to a rating system for foods containing carbohydrates. It shows how quickly each food affects our blood sugar level when that food is eaten by us. Nira having low glycemic index shows the less impact it will be having on our blood sugar levels. Other than this, it is believed to facilitate clear urination and prevent jaundice. These are all the advantages of consuming Nira for our health. So with this let us conclude our discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this article. This article is about fintech. Recently, the deputy governor of RBI had said that speculations about fintechs replacing banks is a misconception. And this is why fintech made news today. So in this article discussion, let us understand what is this fintech. Fintech is an acronym for financial technology. 
it actually refers to emerging digital technology for improving and automating financial services here the improvements are mainly made through specialized softwares and algorithms the recent example is development and use of cryptocurrencies like bitcoin originally the term was coined to refer to technologies used in established financial organizations back end system no it has wider scope and spans across a wide range of sectors like education retail banking investment management non profit fundraising etc now based on the services offered by the fintech they are most properly categorized as the following the first one is digital banking digital banking do survey with all the paperwork and all the banking activities are done online this is about digital banking the next is pay tech which can be expanded as payment technology we have g pay phone pay everything right it all comes under payment technology in addition to this we have this wallet system right mobile wallets this also comes under payment technology this ensure safe and simple consumer experience okay the next one is trade tech which is trading technology various platforms like bitcoin atom c currency all of these uses blockchain technology to ensure private secure and transparent financial transaction and they provide a platform to trade virtual currencies like bitcoins etc then there is insurance tech or insu tech the next one is lend tech which is involved in deposit and lending activity see all these different technology has one thing in common they are all made to raise capital keep this in mind fintech is always changing so in the following years the above mentioned kinds are likely to expand or even change completely the only thing that will be common among these and the future fintechs would be they are all involved in raising capital in one way or another okay now let us see the significance of the fintech first is it will bring down cost of doing business then it will help in breaking geographical barriers for example by using bitcoin i can easily bypass the government and the central bank and make transaction to other individuals all around the world this is the second significance the third significance is fintech enhances customer experience it is easy to use in addition to this it is very transparent so the customer trust on fintech is high due to the increased transparency the last one is it will help in driving financial inclusion in india see india is a large country to enable financial inclusion we must create lot of infrastructure for example we have to establish banks in all rural areas but in a rural area if you establish a bank means it is not necessary that the bank will run in a profitable manner but using this fintech we can reduce the need for opening new branches in the rural area but we can make sure that the people in the rural area get financial inclusion see these are the four significance of fintech now let us see some of the concerns associated with it firstly regulation of fintech is very difficult because the entire functioning of the fintech is based on decentralized mechanism since it is very decentralized monitoring everyone is very difficult for both the government and the central bank second one is diversity like we saw fintech is not a monolithic term there are lot of technology within it that performs various functions so creating a single rules and regulation for the entire framework of fintech is very difficult we have to create different framework for different financial technology this is the second concern the third concern is lack of digital literacy see in a country like india the digital literacy is very low due to lack of digital literacy there is concern that people might be duped by the fintech corporation since fintechs are relatively new and it is not entirely brought under the regulation of rbi there is high chance that these fintech corporation can dupe the people of their savings so these are the main concerns with respect to fintech so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is fintech its types its advantages and the concerns associated with it with this let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions we have five practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question this is a two statement question asking us to find the correct statements two statements regarding the coconut development board is given we have to find the correct statement let us take up the first statement coconut development board is a statutory body established under the ministry of agriculture and farmer welfare 
See, this statement is correct. Coconut Development Board is indeed a statutory body established by the Government of India for the integrated development of coconut production and utilization in the country. It mainly focuses on productivity increase and product diversification. The board, which came into existence in the year 1981, functions under the administrative control of Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare. So, statement 1, once again, is correct. Moving on to the second statement, its headquarters is located in New Delhi. See, this statement is incorrect. At first notice, it may seem like an abstract fact. But thinking a little bit smart, you can get to know whether this statement is right or wrong. New Delhi is located in a climatic zone which doesn't favor coconut cultivation. So, a coconut board of India located in New Delhi serves little purpose. It cannot even easily conduct meetings with the stakeholders. So, higher chances are there this statement is wrong. The Coconut Development Board's headquarters is actually located in Kochi which is in Kerala. And why it is located there? Because Kerala produces the highest quantity of coconut in our country. See, I am not saying that this approach will be right all the time. But this is an approach which we can use to make an educated guess. So, coming back, statement 1 is correct, statement 2 is incorrect. So, the correct answer here is option A, one only. Moving on to the second question. This is a pair-based question and it is also a previous year question from the 2018 paper. In one side, traditions are given and in other side, states are given. We have to find which of the following pairs are correctly matched. Let us take up the first pair, Chapcharkut, Mizoram. See, this pair is correct. The Chapcharkut is a festival of Mizoram. It is celebrated during March after the completion of their Jum operation. It is a spring festival celebrated with great favor and gallantry. Moving on to the second pair, Kanjom Parva Ballad, Manipur. This pair is also correct because Kunjam Parva is a ballad singing tradition that has been existing over the past 122 years in Manipur. It emerged just after the Anglo-Manipur War of 1891. The ballad started in praise of great heroes of the war who sacrificed their life for Manipur. Moving on to the third pair, Tangta Dance, Sikkim. See, this pair is wrong because in our discussion we saw that Tangta is a combative martial art form which is practiced in Manipur. So, here first pair and second pair are correct and the third pair is wrong. So, the correct answer here is option B, 1 and 2 only. Moving on to the third question. See, this is also a previous year question and it was asked in the 2019 prelims paper. Four statements regarding Mian Tansen is given. We have to find the incorrect statement. Let us take up the first statement. Tansen was the name given to him by Emperor Akbar. See, this statement is incorrect. The name Tansen was not given by Akbar. It was given by the ruler named Vikram Jet of Gwalior. So, statement 1 is wrong. See, this question was asked in the UPSC examination, which is picked directly from this news article. This news article appeared in the Hindu newspaper in the March of the same year. All the four statements are taken from this article only. So, to get questions of this type right, you have to make notes of all the historical personalities who are currently making headlines. See, recently, Lachit Borpokan is making news. I want you guys to put it in the comment section, some points about Lachit Borpokan. Okay? So, for this question, the correct answer is option A. Moving on to the fourth question. This is also a two-statement question. Two statements regarding gift city is given. We have to find the correct statement. It is located at Kandla in Gujarat. This statement is wrong because gift city, that is Gujarat International Finance Tech City is located in Gandhinagar of Gujarat. So, statement 1 is wrong. Moving on to the second statement, it is an emerging global manufacturing hub focusing on petrochemicals. This statement is also wrong because it is a special economic zone designated to house India's first international financial service center. So, it is an integrated hub for financial and technological service and not for manufacturing industries. So, statement 2 is also incorrect. Since both the statements are incorrect, the correct answer here is option D, neither one nor two. Look at the last question. See, this is a quiz question for you. In our news article discussion, we saw about a meteorite which is found in Somalia, right? So, I have asked you a map-based question regarding Somalia. I want you all to pick up the map and try to answer the question by looking at the map. Interested aspirants can also post the answer for this question in the comment section. 
The main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answers and post it in the comment section. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.